Hi, Dr. Risto. Hi, Daryl. Hi, thanks for coming back to our conference. Last year, you were exceedingly well received and helped a lot of people with their uh, understanding of prostate cancer. This year, we're going to help people who are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer or wondering whether or not they have prostate cancer. Their, uh, their PSAs are up and what do we do now? Um, can you remind our audience uh, and tell our new viewers like uh, what you do and where you do it? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ben Ristow. I'm a urologic oncologist at the University of Connecticut Health Center in Farmington, Connecticut. Great. And so you see a lot of people with elevated PSAs. They come to you. Why do they show up in your office? How do they know they have elevated PSAs? Uh, most often, it's uh, a primary care physician who has ordered a screening PSA um, and uh, has found an elevated PSA level. Uh, and that triggers a referral. Um, every once in a while, we see uh, men who come in with other complaints, um, either blood in the urine, uh, microscopic blood in the urine, or urinary symptoms that we end up checking a PSA on. Uh, and, and sometimes they have an elevated PSA as well. But those would be the most common things that we see uh, in men being referred for an elevated PSA. And actually, it occurs to me, you mentioned blood in the urine. There are other reasons for blood in the urine, including something like bladder cancer, correct? That's absolutely right. As a urologic oncologist, I see both prostate and bladder cancer. Um, and uh, visible blood in the urine uh, is one of the more uh, common presentations for bladder cancer, one of the most common ways that people find out that they have bladder cancer. So it's certainly something that if you see, um, you should talk to your doctor and, and make sure that you get a, a prompt referral to see a urologist. Okay. So let's say, let's pretend for, or, or do a real thing where you've got somebody in front of you. I mean, you know, you've got 4,000 newly diagnosed pe or people who got referred to you and they're crammed into your office. Uh, some of them are, are concerned. Some of them just think it's like getting a tooth, you know, a cavity filled in their mouth. What are, what's the conversation when you first meet them and after you say, hi, I'm Dr. Risto? Um, so I, I usually tell people what PSA is. I give them a little description. Um, so, um, so it's basically a protein that's made by the prostate gland and its actual job in your body is to make semen less viscous so that the sperm can swim to the egg. Um, so that's actually what PSA is. Um, the blood test for PSA, um, I think it's helpful to understand the history a little bit. So it was originally designed as a test um, to detect prostate cancer recurrence after the prostate has been removed. And in that setting, it's actually probably one of the best biomarkers that we have in all of cancer uh, writ large, um, because the prostate gland is the only thing that makes appreciable levels of PSA. Um, so if you have detectable PSA in your bloodstream after the prostate has been removed, um, that's often a sign that perhaps there is a recurrence. Um, so that's when it was, how it was originally used um, as, as a blood test. Um, it was then moved into the screening setting, and some of the interpretation of an elevated PSA in the screening setting, when you still have a prostate gland, um, can be a little bit nuanced. And so uh, I often have a discussion with men about what their particular risk factors are or how old they are um, to, to gauge a little bit of how, how high my antennae should be up that I'm concerned that there could be a prostate cancer diagnosis. Um, there are some nuances in uh, PSA. For example, if you have a history of PSA levels and you've seen a rise over time, um, that might be an indication that uh, we need to look into that a little bit further. Um, there are derivations of PSA. Uh, one of those is called a free PSA level. And it turns out that benign or non-cancerous prostate tissue makes a higher amount of free PSA. Um, and so you can take that free PSA and calculate how much there is compared to the total PSA and that can give you a percentage. And usually, if you have higher than 25% free PSA compared to the total PSA, that's generally an indication of, of non-cancerous disease. Um, lower percentage free, like on the order of 10%, maybe 11%, um, that also is something that might raise my antenna that there could be a prostate cancer present. Yeah, we, we without getting too political, we say that more freedom is better. 
Yeah. That's and, right. Yeah. And, and not many euro i mean we're i mean here we are like uh, in the 2020s you know 20 or close in 2021 going into 2022 and there's still urologists that i meet that say i don't know what to do with free psa I, I, or i think it's irrelevant or just a gimmick uh what do you say to them um i think it's a tool in the toolbox um because psa can be a little bit difficult to interpret um, it's, it's helpful, I think, to have as many tools as you can. Um, I think it, it can be helpful in sort of borderline cases. So when the PSA is between four and 10, uh, generally speaking, um, free PSA can help make a decision about how concerned you are that you, there could be a prostate cancer present. Okay, so now we're sitting in your office, all 4,000 of us, and we're hyper concerned. Uh, what are we going to do today? You know, and what are you going to tell us that we may not be doing? To, we're probably not going to do today because your office isn't large enough to do all 4,000 of us. But what are you going to do? Uh, what are you going to schedule for us? And, and how do you figure out what it is you're going to do on the day that you're scheduled for? So one of the first things I actually do is repeat a PSA level. Um, it's PSA can certainly fluctuate, um, and there are some variations in the tests on day to day. So I usually repeat a PSA level. That's my first move. Um, presuming that's still elevated, um, and you know there may be an indication to look into that farther. Um, one of the more common things that we're doing now is actually ordering an MRI of the prostate. Um, and uh, there was a, a guidelines paper that, that was published um, through the AUA in 2020 um, that reviewed all of the data and suggested that um, almost all men uh, without a, a prostate cancer diagnosis ought to have an MRI uh, prior to their, prior to their bi biopsy. Um, and the reason for that uh, are, are essentially twofold. Um, one is that uh, in about 25 to 30% of cases, there are no abnormalities detected on an MRI. Um, that was shown in one of the trials that was done in the UK called the Precision Trial. And so in those men, um, there may not be a need uh, to do a biopsy right away. And so it, it can, about a quarter of men, it can prevent the need for a biopsy altogether. The other important piece of information on an MRI is if there is an abnormality, it gives us a target to go after. And so that increases our ability to detect prostate cancers also somewhere on the order of 25 to 30%. Um, so one of, the, one of the first things I do, um, if we confirm that indeed there is an elevated PSA level and we have some level of concern for underlying prostate cancer is to get an MRI. So the MRI, I mean, it, I mean I'm certainly one of the first to say, I've, I mean, it's one of the worst experiences I've ever struggled to get through in terms of claustrophobia. Uh, and truly the, the pain of being in that tube was, was tangible, but you know, enough drugs and just sort of just, you know, gritting my teeth and saying, I need to do this, got me through. There are many men who can't get through that, nor should they be forced to. Uh, is an MRI a deal killer in terms of determining whether or not you have prostate cancer? No, I would say it's, it's certainly not. Um, uh, um, there are, I've definitely encountered men who have a difficult experience uh, for exactly the reasons you mentioned, um, whether it's anxiety um, or claustrophobia. It certainly is a fairly lengthy process as far as an imaging study goes, um, and it is in an enclosed space. Um, so if, if um, you know, if we're unable to get someone through, um, either with some um, anxiety reducing medications or, or something like that, then certainly you can proceed with a biopsy uh, in the absence of an MRI. There, that's, that's perfectly reasonable to do. Okay. Can an MRI replace a biopsy? Um, the answer to that, technically speaking, is no. Although I would say that in the 25% of men who don't have a, a lesion or an abnormality on their MRI, you may be able to skip doing a biopsy. Um, I, I always educate men that there's about a 10 to 15% chance that the MRI is wrong 
Um, there are, that's the incidence of MRI invisible prostate cancers. And so there is an importance of, to continue following the PSA levels, even if you have a normal MRI. Um, and there may be an indication for a biopsy down the line. Um, however, the diagnosis of prostate cancer does still rely on getting tissue uh, from the prostate and, and sending that off to the pathologist for analysis. Okay, so it sounds like the, the truth, so to speak, of the matter is if you don't have samples from the prostate, there's still going to be doubt. And ultimately, the idea of sampling creates in itself an inherent doubt, since, you know, sampling is a sample and not a full-blown discussion of what the prostate is. So um, let's now move on to, you're going to do a, you're just going to do a biopsy. Um, first question I would have is, is it going to hurt? Um, so it, yes, is the truthful answer to that. Um, it's, it's, there is some degree of pain. Um, most men describe it as mild uh, to moderate. And um, when we actually put that on a number scale, if you assume that zero is no pain and, and 10 is the worst pain you've ever experienced in your life, most men will put it anywhere between a two and a four. Um, so uncomfortable, um, but in most cases tolerable. Um, I've actually not had an instance um, uh, these, these biopsies, I should say, are, are done most often under a local anesthetic. Um, uh, sometimes um, I do offer men um, uh, an anxiety-reducing medication as well, um, if that can be helpful. Um, so, uh, but men are awake for these procedures. Um, I've not yet had someone tell me that they can't get through it. Um, I, I'm usually able to offer enough um, numbing medication and um, also talking to the patient and making sure that they're comfortable um, throughout the process um, to get them through it. Um, so I would, I kind of tell people that it's not something that you're gonna run to me the next day and be excited to do again, uh, but it's also not gonna be the worst experience you've ever had. Is it the kind of thing where you could have a loved one hold your hand? Yeah, yeah, I, I invite people in as long as they're comfortable with that and that's what they want. I, I personally, I don't have a problem. Uh, having someone uh, next to the bedside um, being available, right? And and the 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 standard way of doing it, the transrectal version, is like a twenty or thirty minute thing at most. Is that right? Yeah, I would. I mean, the whole pr process, um, you know, get, getting to the office and getting in the room and and leaving, I would say, is about that. The actual procedure is probably on the order of ten minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Not much. Not much longer than that. Okay. All right. So. Let's just focus a bit about why a biopsy. I mean, what are you actually trying to figure out by sticking a needle in a prostate and pulling out pieces of flesh? Um, so the, the real question is, is there cancer there or not? Um, that's the underlying question. Um, and so I, I usually tell men that there are three potential outcomes uh, from a prostate biopsy. Uh, the first and the one we hope for is benign prostate tissue or non-cancerous prostate tissue. Um, and uh, I, as you alluded to earlier, it is possible to miss uh, a prostate cancer that is there because it is a sampling and we're not taking the whole prostate out. And so in that circumstance, I tell, I tell men that we need to continue to follow their PSA, uh, but that that is, a, that is a good initial finding. Um, we can also find prostate cancer. And I, before I even do the biopsy, I talk to men about the differences between uh, low, intermediate, and high-risk prostate cancers, um, because I want men to know and not be surprised by the fact that if we find a low-grade prostate cancer, I'm probably going to recommend that we watch it. Um, I think having that discussion up front is helpful, um, because when someone hears that they have cancer, it can be frightening. Uh, and um, I think that if you lay the roadmap ahead of time that it, there are different kinds of prostate cancer and it's not black and white and that there's a, there's a spectrum and that the low risk ones are generally kind of indolent behaving or benign behaving, um, it's more helpful when you then come back to people with the result and say it was low risk, so we're gonna watch this. 
Um, so that would be, you know, option two. So benign, non-cancerous, low risk prostate cancer, and then an intermediate or high risk prostate cancer, I, I will tell them that that's often the, the kind of prostate cancer that requires some form of treatment. Um, and, and that can be either in the form of radiation uh, or, um, or uh, surgery. Um, and so I'll, and I say, if that happens, I'll, I'll bring you back into the office and we'll talk about those, those options and, and figure out what's best for you. All right. Well, let's not go there today. Uh, but the, I, I mean, it sounds also the, the, I, so you got a prostate, how, how much, I mean, people talk about walnuts and, you know, it's walnut size. I mean, I haven't seen a walnut in person for years. I mean, what, I mean, you know, I mean, at mail care, we use a strawberry, you know, large strawberry. I mean, wh what piece of fruit does it most look like to you? Um, that's a good question. I, people do say a, a walnut. I would say in most men, it's, by the time they're getting a prostate biopsy, it, it's probably a fair amount larger than a walnut. Um, but um, maybe like a, a small plum. Okay, and it's sort of the shape of a plum or shape of a strawberry? Um, I think? would say it's probably more similar to a strawberry or a pear. Um, yeah. So the, the base tends to flay out a little bit and the base being the side that's that's close to the bladder. Um, and then it sort of tapers down towards the apex, which is the side that's more towards the, the penis and the urethra. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have to get away from the walnut thing. I mean, for one thing, you know, I mean, you know, again, at the risk of sounding woke or political, I mean, that's like an upper class white construct. I mean, how many people actually have walnuts in their homes, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, strawberries are much more familiar globally, uh, pears also. Um, it's just that the pear typically is a bit larger than what you would see as a prostate, mm -hmm. I think. So, yeah. okay, so now we're poking the, the strawberry slash pear. How much of that strawberry or pear are you pulling out compared to what you're leaving? Uh, so the um, the actual so so I can kind of talk a little bit about what the biopsy device does. So yeah, yeah, it, it's a it's a thin needle, um, uh, it, probably about a millimeter or two uh, in diameter, um, and the length of the of the biopsy is about one and a half to two centimeters. Um, so it's it's a small piece. It's about an inch in, in size, uh, in length, um, and and the the diameter is much much smaller than that. Um, so you can think of it as a very small cylinder. Is it smaller than the flu shot I had earlier today? Um, it's about around that size. Okay. So uh, and you're doing how many samples are you are you after? Uh, so the traditional transrectal biopsy is uh, 12 samples. Um, in the event that you have an MRI, we often will do the 12 traditional samples plus two or three samples in each area where there's an ab abnormality on the MRI. Um, so you know, anywhere from 12 to 16 or so, I would say is a reasonable number uh, of biopsies. So I just heard my my virtual audience sitting behind me uh, raise their fists and sh or their hands in shock. Wait a minute, Doctor Ristow, you're telling me that the MRI is going to make me have more samples pulled from my prostate? I thought you were going to target things and have less samples. So it's a it's a great question and one that I get all the time, um, and. It's interesting. There's actually some controversy on this point uh, in the urologic community. Um, in the United States, we tend to think that we're able to find uh, clinically significant prostate cancers, so the ones that we want to find, um, uh, both in the traditional template and in the targeted biopsies. And so it's the combination of both of those that provides the optimal diagnosis for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the UK, in some areas, you may get only a targeted biopsy, um, but there's some concern in the United States that in doing only a targeted biopsy, you may miss up to 20% of biopsies that are of cancers that are actually located outside of the area where there's an abnormality on the MRI. Okay. So 
and then the samples are are what how are they stored i mean do, do you give them back to the patient do you take care of them and send them to a pathologist to look at how does that play out yeah so they go in a preservative called formalin um and that um then goes off to the pathologist and they um do some staining uh of those tissues and look at it under the microscope and they assign uh a diagnosis, whether that's um, normal or benign prostate tissue or a prostate cancer. Okay, but those are my samples. I own them. I'm just sort of lending them to you, lending them to the pathologist to look at and give me an opinion if I want, or indeed in many cases should, uh, ask for them to be returned. They'll be returned to me uh, outside of those that are just you know, destroyed or discarded. Is that correct? Uh, so that's a great question. I, I haven't encountered that exact question, um, but I, I believe that um, our pathologists keep uh, the specimens and they're, they are not typically returned uh, back to the patient. But if I want a second opinion on my pathology, let's say I want to send it to another pathologist at another lab, how does that, I mean, how does that work? Absolutely. So that's definitely something that we uh, can do and facilitate. And so if uh, that is driven uh, by uh, a suggestion that I might make um, uh, if there is a question about the diagnosis or if a patient comes and says, I would like a second opinion or a review of the pathology slides, um, all, all we, that we need to do is, is contact the pathology department in our hospital and ask that the slides are, the representative slides are sent out to um, whomever would the second opinion would be. So that, that actually, that process is, is relatively easy to do. Okay. Let's get into like this new idea that actually stems from a much older idea, which is that there's a different way of doing biopsies than has been, let's say, the gold standard for the last 10, 15 years or so. Um, let's spend five or 10 minutes talking about that because uh, you know, as prostate cancer is a world of choices at, at all stages. And here's yet another choice that someone who has yet to be even diagnosed has to make. What's that all about? What are we talking about? Yeah, so the, the traditional way uh, that, um, that biopsies have been done are, is, is through the rectum. Uh, and so uh, the actual uh, process is that an ultrasound probe is inserted into the rectum. Um, I usually tell people that feels a bit like having a large bowel movement, so it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's not usually a painful experience. Um, and then the, the area around the prostate is uh, numbed using a numbing medication, uh, much like you might get if you went to the dentist uh, to have a tooth pulled. And um, the actual biopsies are done through the rectal wall. And um, I actually have a, a, a little demonstration that I can uh, show you here. Yep. Um, um, is this coming up okay? Yeah, and by the way, there, there's a contest um, over the, uh, this demonstration. Um, let me see if I can. So if you can figure out what's unusual about this demonstration, then A, you've won the contest, and B, you have to triple your donation to mail care. So, uh, <laughs> so um, please continue. Absolutely. So this, this is a little schematic of what a transrectal uh, biopsy, which again is, the, is the, the vast majority of urologists in the United States are using this technique. Um, and so the, the ultrasound probe is, the, is what you see in the rectum. And then just on the top of that, and, and you can see it blown up in the image next to it, is the biopsy device. And so you can see that the, the prostate is actually in very close proximity to the rectum, at least the posterior aspect of the prostate is. And posterior and means what? The, the backside. So the, the, the side of the prostate that is closest to the rectum um, is, is referred to as the posterior uh, prostate. And um, the biopsies are actually done through the rectal wall. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this a little bit later, but one of the potential disadvantages to this is that the rectum is not a sterile place. And so often we give people antibiotics um, around the time of the biopsy to reduce the risk of a urinary tract infection, or even sepsis, which is an infection that gets into the bloodstream. 
Um, the other thing that you can see is that the tube that's running sort of through the middle of the prostate um, is called the urethra. That's where the urine leaves the bladder and comes out uh, into the world. And you ideally don't want to biopsy through the urethra because it is a fairly vascular place and can bleed. And so you can see that there's a whole piece of the prostate, which we refer to as the anterior prostate, which is above the urethra. And it can be a little bit challenging to get a good angle to biopsy the anterior prostate um, from the rectum, from that side, because the urethra is, is in the way. So um, the, a, a, an alternative technique uh, that has been proposed and actually was, was in use um, very early on, uh, in, as you alluded to earlier, uh, is called the transperineal uh, technique. Um, and just for reference, the, the perineum is the, the part of the body that's underneath the scrotum uh, where the testicles live, uh, but above the anus. Uh, so it's that flap of skin uh, in that space. Um, and so I have a little uh, diagram here that sort of describes the path of a biopsy needle um, with these two approaches. So on the bottom, you see the transrectal biopsy, which was depicted in the prior image. Um, and on, above, you see the transperineal biopsy, um, which is detected in the upper image. And so you can see that that needle actually traverses through the skin um, to take a biopsy from the prostate. And what's different about that is we can actually sterilize that skin so that you actually don't need antibiotics um, around the time of having the procedure done. And the risk of infection is much lower than it would be with a transrectal um, prostate biopsy. Um, the other piece that is a little bit exploratory is that because you're coming in at a different angle with the transperineal biopsy, it can be easier to detect tumors that are located in that area of the prostate above the urethra. Um, so that so-called anterior prostate. Um, so um, those are the sort of two different approaches that um, are currently being used. So, I mean, it, it almost seems like a common sense thing to do the transperineal. Why isn't that the gold standard? Uh, I think until recently, um, it has been a, a little bit more challenging uh, to actually uh, identify, so the ultrasound probe is used to follow the biopsy needle into the prostate so that you can be, assur be assured that you're biopsying the correct thing. Um, and the distance between uh, the, where the biopsy needle uh, leaves the ultrasound probe and the prostate is much shorter uh, when you go through the rectum than it is when you go through the, through the perineum. And so it, it can, it's a lot easier to hit the, the prostate going with a transrectal approach. Um, recently, there have been some um, biopsy guide devices uh, that have been used that enable uh, the, the urologist to more accurately traverse the length between the perineal skin and the prostate uh, and ensure that indeed you're biopsying the prostate. And so I think part of it was just a technically demanding uh, thing. Um, uh, I think um, another part is being able to get an, a good um, anesthetic block. So the, the numbing medicine um, can be a little bit more challenging uh, with the perineal approach. And so, um, you know, and there's also the, the transrectal approach works well um, and, uh, and people and, and urologists are used to it. And uh, so that's what uh, that has been used. And so I think there was also a degree of inertia um, uh, because we knew that the transrectal biopsy approach diagnosed prostate cancer, and that was the goal of the procedure. Um, but uh, recently, people have started to think a little bit outside the box, uh, particularly with the advent of you know the so-called superbugs that that we hear about, um, the bacteria that are resistant to many antibiotics. Um, to to start asking the question of whether we could improve the way that we diagnose prostate cancer. Um, and perhaps be a little bit more responsible with, with how we use uh, antibiotics. Right. So, and thank you to the Mayo Clinic for those uh, very inclusive um, 
diagrams. The idea, and that was a hint for our audience, uh, but, but the idea of the transparent needle uh, not being as, as well imaged by uh, uh, the ultrasound, I mean, is that really a trade-off or is that just a description? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're what is it real? Is it real? Does it create a, a, a significant negative, or is it just you're just describing like there's a bit more distance, so the ultrasound isn't describing the prostate so, in the so same think, way? Yeah, I mean, I think the image of the prostate is similar because the, the actual ultrasound probe is in the rectum, whether you're doing the biopsy via a transrectal approach or a transperineal approach. The, the challenge is actually the further. Um, you have to drive the biopsy device between its entry point and the prostate, the, the more difficult it is to make sure it's going into the correct place. And so I think it was more of a technique um, challenge. Uh, and there, you know, there is a learning curve associated with um, uh, becoming an expert uh, at the transperineal technique. Um, interestingly, there, there, the urologic community is still a little bit unsure about the role of transperineal versus transrectal uh, prostate biopsy. Um, there actually is a randomized trial um, going on. Uh, Dr. Jim Hu at Cornell um, is running a multi-institutional um, uh, PCORI trial, which is a which is a patient-reported outcomes institute that is funding it. Um, that's looking at basically randomizing men between transrectal and transperineal biopsy um, and looking at pain scores, um, tolerability, infection rates, and prostate cancer detection. So we were very you know, excited to hopefully learn from that trial um, in terms of what, what's going to be the best moving forward. But that trial's focused on the United States. Uh, I mean, isn't there already significant data from Europe and other countries, other countries yeah, so, in Europe? Yeah. So um, there, there are there are really no randomized trial data, um, but um, the the intuitive benefits um, both from the UK and and in Australia um, of uh, improving responsible use of antibiotics and reducing the risk of infection um, have have led to them pretty rapidly adopting the transperineal approach uh, as the standard of care. Um, I think in the United States, um, the verdict is still out in terms of which approach um, is going to be the optimal approach moving forward. So what drives that division? And let, let's do get a bit political or, you know, uh, you know, a professional organization here versus there kind of thing. It seems like a binary discussion, either it's better or it's not. You know, and transperineal, you know, reduction of of, of opportunities for sepsis, uh, opportunities to uh, sample uh, aspects of the prostate that aren't typically sampled in a trans uh, rectal, and uh, the patient gets a better understanding of uh, their, you know, their state of health as a consequence, and retains has is more likely to retain a state of health, meaning they won't have to suffer an infection, mm -hmm. uh, which could in fact be deadly in and of itself. Sepsis is nothing to joke around with. Mm -hmm. It's done in Europe, done in Australia, or done in uh, the UK, done in Australia with success. What's the problem with what's, I mean, what's going on here in the US? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a fair amount to unpack there. Um, the there have been ways using the transrectal approach. Um, an example of that would be getting a, a rectal culture um, prior to the biopsy that have done a good job in reducing the risk of infection and sepsis and, and probably bringing that down close to the risk of transperineal prostate biopsy. Um, you still need an antibiotic. And so some would argue that the ability to omit antibiotics altogether using the transperineal approach um, still makes that better from that standpoint. Um, I think that the not an issue specific to prostate cancer necessarily, but it certainly comes into play here. There's there's a difference uh, between data uh, being available 
and the implementation of that data. Um, so there are a lot of things that we know are potentially uh, better, uh, even perhaps are in guidelines, um, but disseminating that information um, throughout you know, all aspects of urologic care is actually quite a challenge. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're asking people uh, to, um, to move from a technique that they're very comfortable with and they can do in their office in five to 10 minutes pretty quickly and be able to have good um, uh, throughput in the office. Uh, from a practical standpoint, that's important. Um, and um, also potentially from an access standpoint for people to get into the office um, and asking them to change that to a different technique that at least at first is probably gonna take a little bit longer. Um, there's, there's, a, there's less of a degree of familiarity um, with the approach. Um, they may have to buy some additional equipment. Um, a, the probe that's used for a transrectal biopsy is actually different than the probe that's used for um, the ultrasound probe that is, that's used for a transparent lineal prostate biopsy. So there may be some upfront cost uh, associated with people to, to transition. Um, so I think there are um, a number of factors uh, that, that are potentially at play in terms of shifting uh, people or, or urologists from what they're comfortable with and works um, to potentially um, a, a new procedure um, that may have benefits, but in the, in the short term uh, may also have some either costs or downsides to them. Yeah. From your real world experience, you're actually doing both types of biopsies. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, in terms of uh, patient satisfaction and patient utility of, un of the information uh, derived from the various uh, biopsies? Um, so we've looked at our, our data um, in terms of, and, and actually compared it to uh, a, a like our transperineal data and, and compared it to a transrectal data. And, and the cancer detection rates are, are pretty similar. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that there is, um, there is a concern in terms of cancer detection between the, the transperineal and the transrectal approach. Um, tolerability, um, you know, I, I've done both local anesthetic with a transrectal and, and local anesthetic um, with a, um, with a transperineal, I would say it's probably pretty similar. I, I do think that there's something about, um, so in a transrectal biopsy, men are often in what would colloquially be known as the fetal position um, when they're having their, their biopsy done. So sort of laying on their side with their knees up, up to the chest. Um, I think that's a little bit of a vulnerable position to be in. Um, you can't really see the person and what they're doing necessarily behind you. And, and so they're there may be a psychological component to that. For, for a transperineal biopsy, we, men are actually laying on their back. Their legs are up in stirrups, which is also potentially a compromising position, but you can easily crane your neck and just look at the person who's doing the biopsy. And so I don't know that anyone's specifically looked at that, but anecdotally, um, I think that's helpful because I can make eye contact with people as I'm doing the biopsy and ask them if they're doing okay. Um, and, and so I think from a tolerability standpoint, they're, they're probably pretty similar, but I've heard more people talk about how they've been uncomfortable with the transrectal approach as opposed to uh, uncomfortable with the transperineal approach. Yeah, and really good you mentioned eye contact. Uh, we've been looking at how eye contact affects the quality of consult, whether you know, a doctor is directly in front of a patient or the patient's off to the side, or uh, the pa uh, doctor takes a moment to actually sit next to the patient shoulder to shoulder, sort mm -hmm. of like in a, you know, a horizontally kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, we still don't ha have any understanding yet. I mean, you know, we're still looking at that. Uh, but, but eye contact really is a good way to, uh, to um, not necessarily measure a way to check the temperature of the patient. Uh, and you need that, you want that, and because you want, you're, you're caring for that patient every split second that you're doing things to them. Yep. Yeah, no, good. Um, and I, uh, I guess as a sidebar question, as we close this out, uh, and a very good discussion, uh, uh, patients always ask uh, in our support group network, you know, doesn't the biopsy spread cancer? Uh, what's your response to that? 
or understanding? Of yeah, very common question that we get. Um, the, the answer to that um, it, in, in specific terms is no. Um, and, and probably the easiest way to explain it is that the, the actual biopsy um, happens uh, in, a in sort of a closed environment. So the biopsy device is designed so that the, the needle that actually takes the tissue is coming out of a tunnel, essentially, coming out of a, a needle that has a, a bore in it, like a tunnel. And so it, it comes from inside that tunnel, out of the tunnel, grabs the tissue, and then back into the tunnel. And then the needle is extracted from the body. So when the piece of tissue comes out, it's actually not in contact with anything else. It's inside of a tunnel. So, um, so it, it really doesn't have the ability, even though you have a needle track, the tissue that you're removing is not in contact at all with that needle track. Yeah, and so of the half dozen or so times I've asked that question during one of these recordings, that was the best response. Okay. No one has, no one has mentioned that it's encased, you know, as you're withdrawing the needle, yeah. uh, and it's extra. I mean, because it is, and you know, yeah. it's. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, it's it's relatively. I mean, you know, I mean, they'll, you know, if you take a million instances of anything, there'll be an one outlier where somebody has this extraordinary story and sure. you know i'm sure somebody could point to that but you know biopsies are not spreading cancer that's a good sort of way to postulate you know an argument in favor of biopsies and for the you know if you have an example where it did you know that's a rare occur and that you know that's you know don't cross streets, stay at home and lock the door because, Correct. <laughs> you Correct. know, and enjoy takeout and, and uh, you know, home deliveries, you know. So, um, okay, thank you very much for this. Uh, this uh, it, it's good to have a clear, uh, a real world understanding of what the biopsy experience is like, what the uh, first meeting with the urologist is like, and I think uh, people who view this will feel more confident uh, go both going into those meetings, those first time, hi, you're my new urologist, uh, and feel confident peppering them with dozens of questions that may seem absurd at first glance, but are critical and important to the patient. And uh, the doctor can provide a clear understanding for the patient. So thank you for uh, demonstrating that to us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate the invitation to uh, talk to your group. Okay. Um, hope to uh, speak with you again soon. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. You're very welcome.